it's that time again. We're going to look back over the action from the Premier League, and we're joined by Paul. Paul, thanks for coming in again. Thanks for having me. We've had two blistering weeks. We'll start in Glasgow, and what a night that was at the Hydro. Yeah, Glasgow never disappoints, uh, whether it's controversial thoughts or whether it's a great standard or the atmosphere, but I'll tell you what, um, Glasgow really did bring the atmosphere, and it just went up that extra notch. There was pressure on Gary uh, from, from the off that night, but... You could see that he wasn't on his best, but managed to get the win anyway. Mm. And you could see the relief on his face when he finally did get that win. Yeah, I was going to say, Simon actually played really well against him and arguably should have got something. But that little percentage that Gary found when he needed to. Yeah, and that's, I think that's the difference between someone who's won a World Championship and someone who hasn't really. We're talking about fine margins and darts, uh, a game of millimetres, but from a mental perspective and an ability perspective, it's just that one missed double or that one missed treble can make all the difference. And Gary on the night for me was just that little bit sharper. And I can't even imagine how hard it is to play in front of your, your home crowd, especially when there's so much pressure on that one man. Uh, but more often than not, he's up to it. Well, he said that afterwards. He goes, it's more nerve-wracking than any other venue he goes to. Yeah, I always think it's ironic, you know. I, I say this all the time, that the guy's from near Edinburgh, and he has to go to Glasgow. Yeah. Uh, and they still treat him as one of their own. That, that's credit to all the Scottish, uh, Scottish fans. Um, but when he goes to Aberdeen, he gets the same sort of treatment. Yeah. And pound for pound, Aberdeen for me is probably the loudest crowd, but it's the smallest. But um, Glasgow really does bring it, and I, I really want to go up there one day. I say Darragh Gurney finally gets over the line as well. Draws are now gone, he's now won. Beat Mensah Sulevich, and again, looked commanding in that game. Thoroughly deserved it for me. I, I think his, his composure in the game, uh, considering what has went on before with all the draws and the, the not getting over the line, I think Daryl really showed that sometimes he can dig really deep to get the result. And I think we'll see a major change in Daryl Gurney over the next few months because of the fact that he was able to do that. Mensa doing doing a Kim, as we call it in the in the industry. He's he's playing well, big averages, but just can't win. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? Everybody understands how good Mensa Sulevic is. So before they play him, they are aware of his pace now, even though the fact I believe that Mensa Sudovic has got quicker, uh, especially during this Premier League, it's, it's evident. If you look back at his Champions League win to now, I think he's got at least a second quicker in his uh, throw of all three darts. So people are more prepared for what he's got to give now. And it's testament to how much they feel that Mensa is dangerous as to how people are turning up now. So maybe Mensa has got to creep up towards that 110 average to get the wins because Sometimes the, the low hundreds aren't enough. No, I agree. It's just crazy where we're at now. We're at the battle at the top. My, Michael versus Michael. Smith versus Van Gerwen. When Michael Smith went 2 up, did we all think, oh, hang on a minute? Uh, <laughs> um, we did think that, is this going to be Michael Smith's night? Is he going to start shooting a bit further forward? But Van gerwen has got so much experience for his age. And he never seems to panic, no matter what situation he's in. That's been proven in other tournaments that he's played in this year. Um, he doesn't panic about any situation he's in, and he just finds that little bit of overdrive when he needs it. Van Gerwen is just, he's irresistible, uh, no matter what position he's put in by any player. i say to reel off seven legs in a row was just breathtaking. Let me put this to you, Phil, because I've played Michael Smith many times. It's hard enough to get one leg off him, never mind seven in a row, especially the way that Michael scores, Michael Smith, that is. It's so, so hard to do that. And it shows the level of confidence and belief that Van Gerwen has to be able to get seven legs in a row against someone of Michael Smith's calibre. That's quite special. Agreed. Then we had the freak result of the night. Barney beating Peter Wright 7-1. Peter losing 7-1 again for the second week in a row. It was unheard of, unthinkable and strange because he played so well during the Euro Tour and then to get smashed. Yeah, it's... It, it, the game against Barneveld for, for Wright, for me, um, you know, obviously Peter's a very, very close friend of mine, and I don't like to bat against my friends, but all of the form that was put together for me said that it was going to be a Barneveld victory. Raymond looked very calm as usual. I like the way he's, um, he's approaching this Premier League so far. He looks very relaxed. He's mentioning probably five or six times a night in interviews that he's in the gym a lot. It seems to be working because uh, he doesn't look too tired. And he's getting a few, you know, middle night games as opposed to everything being later on in the night like it was earlier in the season. I just think Raymond looks really good. He looks calm, composed. He looks like he really wants to make the top four to, you know, solidify the fact that he wants to play in this Premier League for the next few years. Because if he doesn't play well in this Premier League, he doesn't play well in the majors, then we have to ask the question, 
does he deserve to be in next year? He understands this, and what he can do about it right now is to play well in this Premier League. Uh, was it a surprise that he beat Peter? Not for me. Was it a surprise that it was such a big margin? Absolutely, but the darts that Peter used that night weren't the ones for him. He understood this, and in the Euro Tours since then, he's played so much better with the darts that I feel he should be using. Agreed. Then we we'll finished the night. Rob Cross being go in price, a, a broken go in price by his stage demeanour. Yeah, uh, I feel sorry for Kessie. I mean, he's put so much effort into the first few weeks and he got very little reward for it. Missed doubles, uh, and particularly at, at tops, tens, and fives, which is his game plan. Um, what Kessie's got to do now is he's got to really reassess what he's got to do to be successful in majors for the rest of the year because he does have a lot to look forward to being a top 16 player match play to look forward to he's going to be in the world cup team and they did very very well there last year so be interesting to see who's playing with and how well they do again obviously he's going to be in the grand prix and then world championships at the end of the year he's got to look forward to that but my biggest thing for gezi by the time the premier league's over for him he's got to take a little break just reassess his goals and you know what forget about darts for a a week or two and just rediscover some hunger that's been my message to him and i'll reiterate that again find the hunger again however you've got to do it from glasgow we went to belfast and unbelievable the homecoming daryl gurney got was off the scale i know we we're just talking about glasgow but that was the best night that i've seen in premier league in years because they had this fresh home presence of daryl gurney you could see how much he was enjoying it and that was yeah that was not put on by any means. You could see the genuine joy in his face when he was on that stage. That was something else to watch. And bear in mind that he won the previous week in Glasgow to then go in and take that confidence to his home city. Uh, you just see that he's a totally different player now. Um, I think Darrell Gurney is, is definitely back to where he was when he won the Grand Prix confidence wise. And it just goes to show that if you can get that one win, it can turn your confidence around really, really quickly. If that had happened to Gerwin Price, for instance, a few weeks ago, in Cardiff, for instance, we might have been talking about him being in the top four, but now Gurney, very possibly, not been on that top four door. That had to be the longest walk on in darts history as well. I wasn't timing it, but I might have to Ooh. have a look at it. I did say to myself at the time, I've got plenty of time here to make sure this cup of tea is nice and tepid, yeah. because ordinarily it's a very long walk on, but that one was taken on another level, and why not? You know, he was given a nice outro as well by the PDC when he won that, that match. And it was just pure theatre. I think it was a very, very good night that Belfast deserved. First time as well in that game, I've seen the crowd affect Rob Cross. Now, the English lads don't get it very often, so it's once in a blue moon. Mm. But Cross looked rattled by that for me as well on the night. I, I don't blame him. No. If I was in his shoes, I would have felt exactly the same. But it, it, it's the, the classic home and away game, isn't it? You know, Rob Cross yeah. can go to Manchester, he can go to possibly the O2 at the end of the season. I think he will. He'll go places like that and he'll be very much a home favourite, but um, Daryl having this one night, Rob going into it, he would have thought, well, I'm going to get some stick tonight. And he understood it. And he's very good at handling crowds as Rob, but that was overwhelming. And we've got to give him some credit for you know, still giving it some, um, some great darts at the very early part of the match. Because for me, it looked like he was going to cause Daryl a lot of problems. But ultimately, Daryl just had too much and the crowd did have that extra octave so they could get on uh, got on his back. Again, first off, Gary beat Mensah Sulevic. Different result. Gary put himself into the top four by not playing well, mm. and Mensah, again, not a result he wanted either. Very weird game for me. I, I, um, I saw the odds before the game, and Sulevic was quite long. Yeah. I think he was about 4-1. to one. I thought, how can you possibly have someone at 4-1 to one when Gary's already come out in the public and said, I can't stand playing this guy. And bearing in mind that they played each other twice at Champions League back in September, Mensa won them both. I thought, four to one's very long for this. Um, and you could see that Gary was not comfortable in this game. He was going back to the table for more sips of water. He was strolling around the stage like he was lost sometimes. And you could see the genuine frustration in his face. So for Gary to get through that game, that says a lot about him right now, that he's able to beat the one nemesis that he really doesn't want to play. So his first start kept dropping ridiculously low for Gary as well, which caused him problems. And to say, to get over the line, we all know Gary can play with the best of them, but yeah. now he's scrapping results out as well. Yeah, he's, he's not only doing that himself, but he's teaching Michael Smith how to do that too. Yeah. But I echo what you said about the first start. I've been looking at his first start stats over the last four weeks, and they're not good. 
so most of the time his first dart stat is under 30. It should be nearer 40 because when his first dart's right, he just compounds that 60 and scores a lot of big scores. But when he starts searching for treble 19s and 18s and looking for big scores that way, that's where he can get a bit frustrated. But I think if Gary wants to win this Premier League, his first dart's got to be plum and he's got to fix that very, very fast. Agreed. Then we had Michael Smith against Gowen Price. Bam, going now re relegating, unfortunately, he can't yeah. make it up. Again, he just looked beaten again before a dart was thrown. He didn't look comfortable on his walk on. More concerning was the tweet he sent out less than 10 minutes after playing. Didn't do himself any favours with fans, broadcasters, sponsors, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I don't think it's, um, it's the right thing to do when you're put in such a privileged position. I, I, I do you know, repeat myself in what I said earlier, but you know, I feel sorry for him being in this position, but what you've got to understand is that there's a lot more tied to what you're doing than just playing darts. You've got a responsibility to fans, you've got a responsibility to supporters, and he does understand this. I know he does, but more often than not, when Gezi does send out a tweet, it's usually within that 10 to 15 minute bracket after you've lost. And trust me, from my own personal um, situations in the past, you don't want to do that. You just no. don't, because you don't know what you're typing, you're just venting on a phone screen, and you should just put that phone away for a good two or three hours and then think of something to tweak, if at all. Um, is Gezi making fans out of this? Probably not. Um, he's got a lot of work to do to get himself back on track, but I've got every faith that he will because he's the kind of person who learns from every mistake he makes. I'd like to think he does anyway. Um, otherwise, things could go another way, which I don't want to happen to him because he's, he's a great character for darts. And he's someone who brings the aggression and a, a genuine brand of darts that I like to watch. You said their character. And for me, we've lacked characters over the last five years. When we go back to the, the man, the era, Warner, yourself, Chris Mason, there was characters on stage. And gezi has been a breath of fresh air in that respect for me. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've said to many people in the past that if he ruffles feathers, that's a good thing because it gets people wanting to play him. Yeah. When he's ruffling feathers, it's not like someone like Gary Anderson who's come out and said that you know, he doesn't like his antics. Gary, what he wants to do then is he wants to beat him on the dartboard to keep him quiet. We want these little mini rivalries and we want people to be disagreeing about certain things and having different styles. That's what makes a great sport and a great spectacle. If you had eight to ten players going on that stage being robotic, like John Law was back in the 80s, it'd be boring. Agreed. One of the reasons why John Law's rivalry with Eric Bristow was so good is because Eric was so different to John. And then you've got Bob Anderson put in the mix who was very gezzy like he was very aggressive but in a very very brilliant way because he was my hero um, and then you've got the difference with someone like Dennis Priestley who was very slow but very brilliant but still very watchable in his own way it's yeah. just, everyone's got to be different in their own way and the fact that Gezi's different is a good thing then we had the two Dutch darting juggernauts locking horns unfortunately Michael steamrolled a Barney in the end yeah um, with these two playing each other, sometimes you don't know what's going to happen. Um, we've given Michael a massive lead even before Dart is thrown, but we've seen from Grand Slam final, um, Premier League matches in the past, World Championship matches that will forever live in our memories, that sometimes you've just got to reel it in and say, you know what, William's got a realistic chance tonight. And the way he approaches his games with Michael, I love. Because we've, we've talked on many occasions, Phil, about what Van Gerwen's ambitions are. He doesn't want to beat Phil's records, he wants to beat Raymond's. He wants to be regarded as the best Dutch player of all time. And I don't think that sits nicely with Raymond. So that, that's what makes that rivalry so intriguing. Are they going to be playing each other for a good few years? Absolutely. Will Michael beat Raymond's records? I think he will, uh, but it won't be easy. In the meantime, we've got Raymond standing in his way, which is what makes it great. But Michael was just way too good that night, and he has been for the last few weeks. Again, I think Barney has to lead Michael, he can't, I can't chase him. Michael's one of the best front runners we've ever seen. And just to reel him in, I just don't think Barney's got the game to do that anymore. He can lead and beat him, but I just think that he can't chase anymore. I don't think he can peg him back uh, when, when Michael's in front. I don't think Michael's going to give him enough to get that gap closed. You're absolutely right, because if you think back to when they played in the Grand Slam final, what did Raymond do? He got in front, and then he just held him at arm's length, and he played brilliantly from that position and he should understand that little misses that he made in that game in Belfast 
made all the difference. Because if you had kept him level in the middle of that game, he might have got in front and kept in front. Unfortunately, it was mistakes from Raymond that cost him. Last game of the night, arguably the biggest point in Premier League history. <laughs> Pierre Wright snatching the draw from Simon Whitlock, and now he's favourite to stay up from nowhere. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those moments in, I think it was the 11th leg, where Peter's chipped 120, and you just think that was probably to keep yourself in the Premier League. Yeah. It was one of those moments, and you think, you missed that, you're gone. Uh, you've got to hold your hands up and say, do you know what, Peter Wright? You are one great darting human being because it takes real skill, real composure, and that finish was as good as you will ever see any finish hit because I think he knew how big that was and he was still able to convert it. And then he got himself a point after. And based on the fixtures coming up, the likelihood is he'll probably stay in the Premier League. You don't want to say that it's definitely going to happen, but boy, is he giving himself a better sh a chance now. Well, I say, as we go into judgment, like you've touched on it there, that point puts him a point above Mensa, meaning Mensa has to beat Michael Van Gerwen, pretty much. Yeah, good luck, Mensa. Uh, because the, Michael's not going to have any sympathy for Mensa's situation. Let's just get that out there. He's going to want two points. He wants to stay at the top of the Premier League. We both know that there's a bonus at the end of things, so if you stay at number one, you're going to get that extra 25,000. Michael already feels that's his money. So if anybody stops him from getting close at that, that money is going to be very angry. So Michael will, in my opinion, beat Mensa Sulevich convincingly because he's very comfortable with his pace. He can play anybody slow or quick. Um, but if Mensa has got any chance, very much like what we said with Raymond van Barneveld, he's got to be close to him. He lets him, uh, Michael get a two-leg lead, it's over. Agreed. Whitlock against Price first on. A dead ringer, we all know Price has gone. Do we think we'll see a fight in Gezi, or do we think this is just, he has to play? It's a difficult one, isn't it? Because, you know, we look back at uh, Belfast when, when Gezi had 120, Almost and he went for three tops, and if he'd have hit it, it would have been one of the best shots I've ever seen. Yeah. But that was a sign of someone who was just going through the motions and trying some different stuff. I think that Gezi will do more of that against Simon Whitlock, and Simon will take advantage. Simon's got his own war to fight. He, he wants to be in the top four. He wants to keep accumulating points. Um, this is a very difficult game for Simon because he's going to be up against someone who doesn't care. He's going to be very relaxed. He knows his fate. I'd like to think, for Simon's sake, that he's going to get the points, but it's not going to be as easy as everybody thinks. Agreed. Then for me, this could be the game of the night. Raymond against Michael Smith. Two players that play at a great pace and have all to play for. This could be anything. Well, Mike Lord Smith plays at a great pace all the time, but I've noticed with Raymond's throw that he has been throwing a lot quicker lately. Uh, that will suit Michael more than anybody else. Um, so going forward, it's a very hard one to call because I think they're at the same point of their Premier League um, ambitions this year, needing points but really having to fight for them. This one's got a draw written all over for me. No, I agree. I think it's hard to separate them. Next one again, this could be unbelievable as well. Gary Anderson against Rob Cross. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of respect between these two guys. Um, it, it's just a, a great game of darts right now, but both fighting for top four spots. Rob Cross is in the ascendancy, of course, but he's going to understand that that blip last week uh, in Belfast is just one of those things you've got to take on the chin, and he's really good at taking things on the chin, Rob Cross. Could this be another close match? I believe so. It has the potential to be one of the great Premier League classics. I hope it lives up to that because they could score an abundance of 180s if they want. Oh, that trouble 20 is going absolute batter in that game, that's for sure. Isn't it just? Mensa against MVG, we've touched on it. I think we're both going to agree that this is only going one way and Mensa gets relegated. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that's the way I see it. Uh, this season, Mensa Sulevich has very much solidified the fact that his pick was perfect. He was ready for the Premier League, but unfortunately the timing of his performances was all wrong. He could have played certain games where he averaged over 100 against someone else and won easily and then potentially had his bad week against someone else. But that's the Premier League, isn't yeah. it? It's round-robin format. Um, but I do see a Michael win here, probably by three or four legs, and Michael getting those two points and going even further ahead in the Premier League. Last one on Judgment Night, we've got Daryl Gann against Peter Wright. Again, this has the potential to be a really good game. It could. Um, Daryl's really high on confidence in the Premier League matches right now because... When you win two in, the, in a row like he's just done, you think, yeah, he's, he's got the hang of this now. He knows how to get over the line. 
he's got a bit of confidence from uh, throwing a lot of 180s last week in Belfast, which was great to watch. Some of them were particularly good being so close together. But Peter is playing good right now because of the European Tour. Um, played a little bit better in Belfast. I've got a funny feeling that this, this could either be a draw or a Daryl win. Um, Daryl's really shooting forward and it's a really tough one to call for me. If, if Peter's going to get the win here, I feel like he's got to get a lead and protect that. Um, because it's, I, that's the only way that I see a weakness in Daryl, is if he's put under pressure with someone being in a lead to him. Agreed, because he's one of the biggest scorers in the business now. If he scores the way he should, Daryl Gurney, he will score more 180s in the world than anybody else. That javelin like dart that he throws, he just has this ability of getting in on a pinhead. And it looks so attractive when he does it. If his doubles were as good as Peter Wright's, there's a world championship formula. Absolutely. I categorically will tell him that. And he knows he's got to practice more on his doubles because valuable misses this year may cost him a top four spot. Agreed. So we're approaching judgment night. First half of the Premier League almost done. What's been your standout moment of the first half? Well, I did, I did enjoy the game between Michael Van Gerwen and Peter Wright in Cardiff. Uh, I thought that was a, a phenomenal thing. Um, and especially when Wright he was in the bottom two and his only win was against MVG, I thought, well, this is what Premier League's all about, unpredictability. But for me so far, the Premier League has been all about that Anderson Wright draw in Berlin. It is one of the most enjoyable Premier League matches I've ever watched. And I didn't want it to end. Um, great draw in the end. But the crowd, you could see that they'd already had highs that night. But for them to actually crescendo with that match at the end, it was perfect for a new venue. And I want to see more matches like that. Agreed. I say we look forward to what happens after Judgment Night. The double header at Rotterdam obviously is the standout one that everyone's looking forward to now. Yeah. That, uh, will, that will be fun, won't it? It can't not be, can it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, um, we look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. And then we'll discuss what's happened after Judgment Night and the upcoming fixtures. Again, Paul, pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Live Darts TV. Hope you enjoyed the show.